All right. Now, this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to help explain the, just a spiritual growth in the Christian life because it's a process, right? And we're going to start off as well. The reason why we're starting off in John chapter 3 because the first step is getting saved. Right? The first thing you have to do is get saved. But see, a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot more that, spoke, that should come after you get saved. So, you know, this life isn't just about, well, I'm saved and that's good. Now I'm just going to go off and do whatever I want to do. Right? I mean, that's, there's a lot more to it than that. Obviously, you know, we believe that, that once a person is saved, they're saved eternally. God saves you when, when you put your faith in Christ. And that's what we see here. In John chapter 3, you know, verse 16, the most famous verse probably in the entire Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's exactly what we believe. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. It's a promise. Everlasting means forever. Once you're saved, you are saved forever. Now, what Jesus said here, we're going to flip, go back a little bit earlier in John chapter 3. He has this conversation with Nicodemus. He was, he was a Pharisee, right? And he sits down, and, and, and this Nicodemus has, you know, he has kind of like an honest heart. He's talking to him, and he, and he explains, he says, look, we know that, you know, I can see these miracles you're doing, and no man can do these things unless God's with him. So that's, what, that's, you know, that's the attitude he has as he's approaching Jesus. So Jesus answered, and he says, look, verily, verily, I say unto thee, in verse 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So right there, Jesus said, look, you have to be born again in order to go to heaven, in order to see the kingdom of God. This, that's the first step. So we're talking about spiritual growth in the Christian life. The Christian life starts at birth, right? He says, you have to be born again. Now, Nicodemus doesn't understand this. He thinks, he's just thinking physical. He's thinking, wait a minute. How can I go back in my mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus is like, no, you, you're not getting it. Jesus answered in verse 5, he says, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So here's explaining, look, you have to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, a lot of people will think, and I'm not going to spend too much time, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, born of the water, that means you've got to be baptized. That's not the case. That's not what that means. He explains it in verse 6 when he says, because the two things he mentions in verse 5, he says, I say to the except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. So you've got two births, a birth of water and a birth of the Spirit. In verse 6, he explains, that which is born of the flesh, which is born of water, is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, which is being born of the spirit. Now, when it just says born of the water, well, I'll tell you what, when a, when a baby is born physically into this world, the woman's water breaks. That's exactly what that's talking about. When it says you're being born of water, that's the physical birth, that's the fleshly birth. And then the second birth is the spiritual birth, right? Now, the same way, and I love explaining this so when I go out and talking to people about soul winning, because I think you know, God has given us um, these illustrations and he likens being saved to receiving a free gift or being born again so that we could just comprehend the fullness of what he's talking about. When he talks about being born again, I, I always, I love this illustration because I think of, I have three little girls in the back row there, right? They all have one birthday. They were all born at one time individually, right? They all have, they all have the same birthday. They all have one birthday individually. They're born in a moment. And they will always be my children no matter what. Now, I have rules for my children. You know, there's certain things I don't allow them to do. And it's not because I hate them. It's actually the contrary. It's because I love them. I want them to grow up right. I want them to do the right things. I care about them. Right. I mean, this, this is obvious, right? I know, I know I'm, I'm delving into this, but it's important to understand this when we lay out the, these aspects because they relate exactly with the way when we're children of God. So bear with me. When No matter what they do, now if my children transgress my laws, my rules, right? They're going to receive some kind of a punishment. They receive a discipline, but I still love them. They're still my children. No matter what they did, if they were to do, if they were never to obey me, if they were to do everything contrary to what I said and be a very, very, very bad child, you know what? They're still my children, and I'm still going to love them. 
Now, we might have a bad relationship with each other, especially as they grow up, you know, they turn into teenagers. If they just to be rebellious, they don't want to do anything, have anything to do with what I say, they're breaking my rules, they're not doing anything that I want them to do, and they're being extremely rebellious, we're not going to have a good relationship. There's going to be some strife. There's going to be some conflict. I'm not going to be blessing them and, and just saying, oh, sure, yeah, take the car out, do all this stuff, and just giving them lots of nice things. Because if they're just constantly, you know, having a stiff neck, I'm not going to do that. But I'm still going to love my children. I mean, there's no getting around that. And they still are my children. So let's apply that to being children of God, right? God has rules for us. He has them all laid out in his word. We're not perfect children. I know my daughters aren't perfect. I don't know anyone in this world that is perfect that obeys all of the rules that God has laid out for us, right? Now... If we break God's rules, does that mean God hates us? No. Now, he might have to discipline us in this lifetime. I mean, the reason why a person receives correction is so that they can be corrected and, and start doing what's right. God will correct us in this lifetime, but he's not going to cast us out of the family when we die and send us to hell if we're, born, if we're born of the Spirit, if we're born again, if we've received eternal life. We are his children. We will always be his children, and he deals with us as children. And that's one of the great assurances that we can have when you know that you're saved, when you know that you're actually born again, you're a child of God. Hey, God's going to deal with you as a child, as his child. He gives you rules not because he hates you, it's because he loves you. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to do what's right. And, and he gives us these guidelines. He gives us, it's not even just guidelines. They're rules. They're laws. They're commandments. He expects us to obey them. And again, we're not perfect. But just because someone goes out and maybe they are a bad child, maybe they do thumb their nose at God, maybe they say, you know what? I don't want to listen to what you said here. I want to go out and drink. I want to go out and party. I want to go out and do whatever. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not their child. That just means they're being a very bad child of God. Okay, and that doesn't mean that God's going to send them to hell when they die. If they have eternal life, there's, it's impossible to go to hell. It's, it's everlasting. It's eternal. Now, does that, is that person's life, though, going to be blessed? If they decide to just completely do everything against what God says? No, of course not. If we do what's right, and you know, that's going to be pleasing to God. That's how we, Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the way that we can show God our love, we can show him our appreciation. We can show him, hey, thanks for saving my soul that was bound for hell. And, and thanks for being such a gracious and merciful father to me. You know, we can keep his commandments. And that, that will show our love and our respect for our father in heaven. Now, again, real quick, we just turn back to John chapter 1. I just want to prove this for you. On, on being born again because Jesus Christ says here that we need to be born again. He explains that's being born spiritually, but it's not necessarily explicitly laid out on how, on how that happens. But John chapter 1 explains that real quick in, in verse number 12. The Bible says, but as many as received him, it's talking about the word, if you get the context, talking about Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God excuse me, even to them that believe on his name. So a lot of people think that everyone in the world is a son of God today. And that's simply not the truth, okay? The Bible talks about being born again, being a child of God. And here, if everyone were a child of God already, then why would they need to get power to become a son of God? All right, this just doesn't make sense. So clearly not everyone is a child of God. We need to become sons of God and the way you become a son or a child is by being born again. And how do we do that? It says, even to them that believe on his name. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you believe on the name of Jesus Christ as your Savior, you put all of your confidence in him for your salvation, that's when you're born again. That's when you receive the free gift. Now, that's the birth, right? And again, like I said earlier, I was opening up, there's a lot more to life and a lot more to your Christian life than just the birth, right? Right? And there's a lot of people that are Christians today that are crawling around spiritually as little babies. And they're just not growing at all. Okay. I'm going to go through and just kind of go through the real basics. Okay. These are real basics, fundamentals of the Christian life that we all ought to have starting from birth. First thing you need to do is be born. 
First thing you need to do is put your faith in Christ. Become that spiritual baby in Christ. Put your faith on him. I believe the next thing that we ought to do is get baptized. I believe that should be step number two in your Christian life. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 16. We're going to be there on Wednesday, but just real briefly, Acts chapter 16, verse number 30. This is a verse that I love using when we go out soul winning. And I'm not going to spend too much time on baptism. I preached an entire sermon on baptism about a month ago, going really in-depth in the subject. But Acts chapter 16, verse number 30, we see here... The, um, the jailer in this story with Paul and Silas are in prison. You know, God sends this great miracle, this earthquake, and all the prison doors are opened up and all the shackles are loose. The prison, the jailer wakes up. He thinks everyone took off. He's about to kill himself. Paul says, wait, you know, do yourself no harm. He's like, wait, we're all still here. Don't kill yourself. Don't hurt yourself. We're here. So this is where we catch up in the story. In verse number 30 of Acts 16, he says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is the jailer asking Paul and Silas. And I'll get into this more on, on Wednesday night. But I believe, I don't think he's necessarily thinking of uh, being saved spiritually. I think he's talking about physically. But they answer him with the spiritual answer. Look at verse number 31. It says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in the house. So right there they tell him, look, in order to be saved, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and go to church. He doesn't say you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized, right? He just says you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Look at verse number 33, it says, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. So this jailer, the same hour of the night that, that all this stuff is going on, they preach him the gospel, they tell him, look, you just need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's evident that he does that because he goes and he gets baptized, he and his house, all his straightway, meaning right away. So right after this guy gets saved, he goes and gets baptized. And I'll tell you, if you're sitting here today and you're saved, and you've received Jesus Christ as Savior, but you've not been baptized, you ought to do it straight away. You ought to do it right away. Don't put it off. I was one, I put it off. Okay, I got saved when I was 20 years old, and it wasn't for like another seven years before I got baptized. And, um, and that's not right. Now, it, there's always a time to get right with God. It's never too late to get right with God. You know, if you're not doing things the way, the way that you should have done them, well, let's put those things in the past, and let's keep moving forward. You, you, but every Christian, it's actually a commandment to get baptized. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the scriptures. If you're interested more in baptism, I've got an entire sermon on it. And I can get you a copy of that sermon if you'd like. It's on the internet. But um, the next step in your, in your spiritual life, in your, in your Christian growth, is getting baptized. And that's a one-time thing. You don't need to continue to get baptized over and over. You do it once. Same, just like salvation, right? Baptism is just a picture of, of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and his resurrection, when you get dumped under the water, it's like Jesus being buried in the ground. You come back up out of the water, Jesus Christ raising from the dead. And, um, and, and it's basically just showing, it's openly showing your faith in Christ. And it's something that God has commanded us to do. That ought to be, I believe, in my opinion, the first thing that, that we do. And, and, you know, the rest of these points are not necessarily going to be in any specific order. Um, but they're all things that we ought to do as a Christian in our Christian life in order to continue to grow. So one of the, the easiest thing, one of the easiest things you can do is just get baptized. That's probably the easiest thing on this entire list. It doesn't take much effort to just say, hey, I want to get baptized. You get dunked underwater and it's done, it's over, and you're baptized, and it's good for the rest of your life. Okay, that's an easy thing to do. So there's no excuse not to get baptized. The second thing I want to point you, turn to John chapter number four. Let's flip back a little bit. John chapter number four. Now the next thing I want to point out is, is going out and soul winning. Going out and, and, and just witnessing of your salvation to other people, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people will say, well, look, I don't know that much. right? If you're just newly saved, you say, well, I don't know that much. Well, you know how you got saved. right? I mean, if you're saved, you should at least know how you got saved. You can share that with other people. And that's why on the back of our invitations... You know, when I, when I talk to people, we leave it. It has the Bible way to heaven because that could even help you out. If you're not familiar with the Bible and the verses, you know you got saved. I mean, you know what you believe. You know you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
even that little card that we give out can help you to show other people. But we see here in John chapter 4, look at verse number 25. This is the story of the woman at the well that Jesus was speaking with in John 4, 25. And again, this is, it goes on way before that. Jesus is talking to her and explaining. In verse 14, he says, um, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up in everlasting life. And, um, you know, he's basically preaching to her the gospel. And we're going to jump down here to verse number 25. It says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So she's saying, look, I know that there's going to be a Messiah. I know that, that Christ is coming. And he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus flat out and says, look, I'm he. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. And look at verse 27. It says, and upon this came his disciples. So his disciples come back from where they were. Jesus was alone with this woman preaching the gospel in her and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? Then verse 28, The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So the first thing she does, she goes out and then starts trying to tell other people about Jesus Christ. She starts going out and saying, Hey, look. Isn't this the Christ? I mean, look, the Christ is here. Come and see him. You know, come and talk to him. You know, he's here. Essentially is what she's saying. What she's saying, isn't this the Christ? I mean, he's told me everything I ever did. And I believe that she's already believed at this point. Now she's going out and trying to get other people um, to get saved. And we could jump down to verse number 39 where we see um, it kind of finishes up the story here. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. For the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So we see here, this woman already led people to Christ. She just got saved herself when she put her faith on Christ. And then she goes out, and, it, and the Bible, this is the narrator of the Bible. This isn't just like some person lying. This is the Holy Ghost saying that, that many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him, believed on Jesus Christ, for the saying of the woman, because the woman went out and said, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. People were able to hear that, and that was enough for them to be able to put their faith in Christ. And this woman was successful in going out and leading people to Christ. Now look at verse number 40. It says, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. So more people heard, but they heard Jesus Christ specifically. In verse 42, it says, And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, you're going to say, Okay, well, those people didn't get saved because of the woman in the well. Did they or didn't they? Now, they didn't get saved because of her words that she spoke, right? That's That's clear. They heard Jesus for themselves, but the people that she won to Christ were asking Jesus to stay for a couple more days, and he did because of them. And these people then were also then able to hear Jesus. They heard the woman at the well originally. That at least sparked their interest enough to come and hear more about him. So they didn't believe and get saved from her specific words. But I think that she can be attributed with a lot of the work and, and getting and still pointing them and directing them to Christ. See, you never know. And, and, and people might come at you and, that, and the woman might take that as like, you know, you know, I didn't, um, you know, it wasn't because of what you said. You can't take that the wrong way, especially if you're out trying to witness people, trying to, trying to share the gospel of Jesus and just tell people about Jesus Christ. If someone says, look, well, I didn't believe because what because you told me, but I believe what the Bible said. Fine, great, amen. But that doesn't mean that you didn't have a part in your salvation, and and that's the important thing. See, when we go out, the Bible says, "You go out, you bear precious seed. You'll doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you." When you go out and you and you're preaching the gospel, you're 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 trying to sow the good the seed of the word. You're preaching Jesus Christ. There's lots of ways you know people might hear that. 
even if you just spark their interest in it and then they go back later and they study the word and say, you know what, what that guy was saying is true, amen. I don't expect everyone to just take what I say at face value and just believe it just because I'm saying it. Actually, I, I, I don't even push people to do that. I'd rather them study and look it up for themselves and know that and just compare what I'm saying. And that's what I believe everyone ought to be doing every time you come to service is listen to what I'm saying but then make sure that the Bible's backing up what I'm saying. Don't just blindly believe a person. Now, if someone blindly believes what I'm saying at the door and they get saved, amen. You know, I'm preaching God's word. I'm using God's words, not my own, for the most part when, I, when I'm giving people the gospel and giving them their word. And if they get saved because of that, amen. But um, this is we see here that this woman, she didn't stop to do anything else. She, she just went right out and was able to be fruitful in bringing other people to Christ. And I believe this is an important part of, of the Christian life is going out and doing that because when we do go out and, and preach, the, you know, preach the, the Bible, preach Jesus Christ, and tell other people about Christ, God's going to look down and He's going to see that. He's going to say, hey, here's a person that's wanting and willing to do work for me, that's willing to go out and, and, and tell other people about me, He's going to bless you for that. He's going to see the work that you're doing. And I believe that's important, especially early on in the Christian life. Get started. Get into heaven. Just go out and do it. Don't, you know, pray for boldness that, that you can just speak up. Don't be afraid of what other people are going to think and say. And hey, if you're happy, you know, I always think about this because it's easy to become complacent, right? In our day-to-day -day life, you know, you get so used to things. You know, I could get so used to having this house and eating the food I eat and having vehicles and all these other things that are truly luxury and, 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 and very good blessings, okay? And it's important to have that humble attitude, never to just get prideful or even just complacent and just assume, oh, yeah, of course I have all this stuff or whatever. Well, it's important to have that attitude with the things that you possess, but it's even more important to have that attitude with your salvation. Don't take it for granted. Don't just get used to, oh, yeah, well, I'm saved. You know, whatever. I, yeah, I got saved a long time ago. Sure, I, I took care of that. You should be thankful and happy and rejoicing. Hey, I was a sinner damned to hell. I was, gonna, I was literally going to spend an eternity being burned and tortured and tormented, but because God is so gracious, because God is so merciful, because there's other people willing to spend their time and, and, and trying to teach people, to show people, hey, look, Jesus Christ died for your sins and trying to tell you that because of what God did for me, thank God and praise God that I am saved today. And, and don't lose the excitement. Don't lose that joy of your salvation. It should be enough to help you to want to teach other people and show other people the Bible and say, hey, look, you got this free gift. I mean, if you, if you receive, let me show this example. If for whatever reason you, you found out somewhere, something on the internet, right? Where you could you could sign up, you could put your email address in, and then just by doing that and clicking the send button, you automatically get a million dollars deposited into your bank account. And that's available, and that's just it's just it's just available to everybody. Wouldn't you be going around and saying, calling up your mom, calling up your dad, calling up your brother, sister, you know, just everyone you could, hey, I just got a million bucks just by doing this. Hey, you should do it too. I mean, wouldn't you want it? Wouldn't you want other people enough to, to share the same thing and have how much more eternal life? How much more salvation? I mean, this salvation is the most precious thing in the entire world that you could possibly have, and it's a free gift. It's given to you for free. It's something that you don't have to pay for. You have to work for it. God's given it to you. We ought to tell other people about the same gift. It's not our righteousness. And, and that's the thing. And, and see, there's a flip side to that, though, too. It's not just a great, a great gift, which it is. The alternative is, is horrible. Just as much as you want to have, have someone have that great gift, you also want to love them enough to say, I don't want this person suffering, being tortured, and tormented in hell forever. It's a real place. It's really, I mean, it's going to happen. We always need to keep that. And I don't care what stage you are in your spiritual growth, your Christian life. Always keep that in your mind. Because that's what's going to drive you. That will help you to, to open up your mouth. When you think about those things, when you get embarrassed or when you get shy or when you see someone, you're like, oh, I don't, really, I don't know if I should talk to them. Think about that. 
Envision that person spending an eternity in hell. And then think again, should I just at least open up my mouth? I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? Someone might say, not interested. Guess what? I get it all the time. It's not that big of a deal. But if you don't open up your mouth, how do you know if that person will ever hear and believe? You don't. You can't, you can't just assume that someone else is going to do it. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile people unto God by putting their faith in Christ. We all ought to do that. I believe that's an extremely important aspect of the spiritual life. But let's, um, <clears throat> let's move on to the next point, coming to church. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Right there, four Gospels. You got Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four, and I'm going to read for you First Timothy chapter three, verse fifteen. First Timothy three fifteen says, "But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth." It's extremely important, and especially, especially as a babe, but even throughout, again, all of these points are applied no matter what stage you are at in your Christian development right now. It doesn't matter. These all apply to you. Now, baptism, if you've already gotten that taken care of, then great. You don't have to do that again. But everything else, um, and, and that still applies no matter how long you've been saved. Obviously, you should still do that. But um, everything else, we all need to, to, to understand that this is important. I mean, the Bible says that the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth. So coming to church is extremely important because this is where you're going to get the truth preached to you. I mean, if you're in the right church at least, right? And you ought to be. If you're in one of God's church, if you're in an assembly of believers and, and, and people who are preaching the word of God, this is the pillar and the ground of the truth. It's important. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So he's given off this list of these different um, roles that he's given men to play out. You know, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He has this job for people to fill. And then he tells us why. Why does he give those jobs? Verse number 12. For the perfecting of the saints. The saints are those that believe. The saints are believers. The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. All extremely important things. Those all come from these teachers, from the evangelists, from the pastors. You're going to find that in church. Verse number 13, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. See, when you come to church, it's a place for you to grow spiritually. That's why he says that we henceforth be no more children. See, when you're, when you're born again, you become a child. You become an infant, a little baby in Christ. By coming to church, that will help you to grow. That's going to help you to learn doctrine because God has ordained teachers. He's ordained pastors. He's ordained these people to help you to grow. And that, you know, people who have, who have already been saved for a long time, who have already studied the Bible, have already learned a lot, that could be a teacher to someone who doesn't know that much, come to church so you could receive some of that again. Make sure everything lines up with what God's word says. This is the authority. This is the final authority. But that doesn't mean that you can't learn in church. It, and that's what it's for. That's what you come here for. It's one of the main reasons. It's not the only reason. It's one of the main reasons I was to come here to learn so that you're not tossed to and fro. Because a, a young child, a babe, they're not, they're not founded. They're not grounded. You know, I, we have to hammer things into our children's heads as when they're young to get them to understand. I mean, if someone else comes up and lies, so that's why it's so easy to, to deceive children. You know, you can do those magic tricks and be like, see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove my thumb. Look, girls, do you see this? Watch. Whoa! I just took my thumb off my hand. Can you believe that? 
<laughs> see, it's a lot easier for the for the little children to, to see that and be deceived and, and just and just think, wow, it's amazing. How can you do that? And they'll be like, I remember when I was a child, my dad showed me the same thing, and I was like, man, how do you that I can't do that as children it's easier to be deceived you're going to be tossed to and fro get in a good church come to church hear the preaching again you know make sure it lines up with scripture but but you don't want to be a child forever in your Christian life you want to learn you want to grow you don't want to be tossed because here's the thing it says that carry about with every wind of doctrine there's lots of doctrine out there. there's lots of false doctrine out there by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive there's a lot of people out there it's not just because they have a good heart they have a good attitude and they're just mistaken about something there are people that are lying in wait to deceive there's people out there that are teaching false doctrine on purpose they know that it's false doctrine that's where the false prophets they're in it they're for, for greedy, for filthy lucre's sake, the Bible says, for money. There's a lot of people out there that are preaching and pastoring and teaching damnable heresies because of the love of money. Because they want to keep you coming back, they want to get you throwing your money in the plate, and they want to control you. And you have to watch out for that. So being in a good church is going to help you to grow as a Christian. It's going to help you to learn doctrine and key doctrine, God's doctrine, so that you don't get deceived by all this other stuff that's out in the world. And it's going to help you to get rooted down, to get planted down. And it's also good to just be around other people in the church because you can get edification. You can get strengthened. You get built up saying, hey, I'm not alone in this because a lot of times people get saved and none of their family members are saved. And they're thinking, you know, they might start trying to talk about Jesus and then they just get ridiculed. And then people ostracize them. And they have nobody else and they just feel like they just feel alone. And that's going to make them just clam up and not say anything. But see, when you come to church, you can realize, hey, you're not alone. You know what? A lot of other people have gone through the same thing. You can get strength from that. You get edified. You get built up by knowing that there's other people that are going through struggles. Other people are going through trials and tribulations. Other people have problems. But hey, it's comforting to know that people, the other people, you're not alone in that. Other people are going through it with you or have gone through it in the past and maybe can help you and say, well, look, I went through the same thing. Maybe this can help you to deal with it. Maybe this can help you. And, and, the, and coming to church and being around other people, hearing the preaching can help strengthen you and help you to grow so that, you know, you don't have to be a little baby all your life because little babies have to worry about, well, they don't, they don't really worry about anything, but I mean, it's really easy for them to be, to have something happen to them, right? To have something bad happen to them, to have a you know, bad person just come. And you know, that's why it's kidnapping, right? It's typically not adult napping as much as, as, as people taking little children because they can't defend themselves. They can't fight off the enemy. We need to grow spiritually because the enemy's out there. The devil's out there looking to attack. We need to make sure that we're strengthened, that we're armed, that we're ready to defend ourselves. You need to grow. And coming to church is going to help. And all these things will help with that. That's the whole purpose of the sermon this morning. The next thing we have to do is pray. Okay? And again, not in any specific order, but it's extremely important to have prayer as a big part of your Christian life. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 7. And again, when we look at Matthew 7, it's important to realize it lines up perfectly with what we started off the sermon with, being born again, being a child of God. Keep that in mind. And if you're saved today, you are a child of God. When we read Matthew 7, look at verse number 7. It says, ask and it shall be given you. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is asking. The word pray literally just means to ask. So when we pray to God, we're asking God for things in our lives. Verse 7, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of, of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? God has good things for you. He's just, all you got to do is ask him for it. He wants to hear from you. He wants the communication. He wants your reliance on him. 
We need to rely on Him for salvation, but we also ought to rely on Him for everything else. In our life. We ought to just go to God and bring Him all of our troubles, bring Him all of our problems, ask Him. I mean, He, he uses this example. You know, I can't imagine if my girls came up and asked me, Dad, can I have something to eat? Can I have some food? And I'm like, here's a rock. You know, the, have fun with that. You know, like, like that would be horrible. No father's going to, no loving father is going to do that. With and God is more loving than any of us can possibly even comprehend. He is a perfect loving father. You ask him for stuff that you really need. You And again, I did an entire sermon on prayer. All of these topics I kind of pretty much have covered like complete sermons on. But um, it's important to kind of put them all together here that we can keep them all um, just fresh in our minds and, and they'll, they'll all help us to grow. But, you know, we go to God, bring our prayers. That's why we have our prayer list. That's why we were praying for this, for this young man that has Lou Gehrig's disease because God is a God that answers prayers, okay? And we don't know always exactly how he's going to answer them, but he knows the best way and he knows why things are happening. And, and just don't, and you know, here's, here's one real quick tip on praying. Try to come up with a lot of different attacks for your prayers, for the things that you have need for. Don't just pray like one thing. Now, now we have the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost will kind of help interpret things for us to God if we don't really say things quite the right way. God will understand. But like with this, with this young man, I, I mean, I'll be praying that he gets healed. I'll be praying that other people are comforted. Think about all the different aspects and all the things that go around and that would, you know, if you put yourself in that situation, what are all the different things that could be going on to pray for? Him, right? So, so it's, it's more than just the healing. It's the, I mean, hey, what if he's not saved? Pray that God will send someone over there to preach him the gospel. He's got a short amount of time. Pray that, you know, I don't know, you know, his family will be covered, that people will be taken care of, that, you know, the medical expenses won't be that much, that they'll find a way to deal with this stuff. You know, all the different complications that could come up and in other people's lives and your own life. Right? It's important to pray for others. It's important to pray for yourself. Don't, don't neglect either. Um, next point. Reading the entire Bible all the way through. Now, if you have never read your Bible, every single chapter, every single word of this book, as a Christian, you ought to do that. That is step number one as far as reading the Bible is concerned. Luke 4.4 4 says, you don't have to turn there, the Bible says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. We need to live by every word of God. And if you haven't read every word of God, if you haven't read the entire Bible, how are you going to know how to live? We need this more than we need our bread. We need God's word. Read the entire Bible. That's, that's the, first, the first goal for you if you haven't done that is make sure you accomplish that goal. There's, there's charts in the back. There's an easy way you can do that within the course of just one year if you spend approximately 15 minutes a day. Just stay consistent with it. There's check boxes you can make sure. And you know what, if, you, if you've never gone through it before, but you know, you say, you know what, I know I've read the book of Matthew, cross off all the book of Matthew. Start re you know, cross off the things, you know what, Genesis, I know I've read Genesis, cover. I know that I've read that entire book. Cross it off. So then you can start attacking the stuff that you haven't read yet. You should at least be able to say, look, if I'm saved, if I'm putting all my faith in this book and what this book says and what God's word is for me, I'm going to at least know what it says. Right? And don't stop there either. When you, when you read it, that's just the first step. That's the baby step. When you're a young baby Christian, you need to read the Bible cover to cover. You need to just read the whole thing. You're not going to be able to understand, understand context unless you read the whole thing. And again, that's another reason why it's going to be easy for people to come at you with these false doctrines because as, as the, the, the thing we were looking at earlier that, that uh, Brother Anderson gave me, you know, this guy's pulling out scripture here, he's pulling out a verse here, he's pulling out a verse here. That's not what that means. Yet if you follow the line of thinking, you might be deceived by that. If you don't know the Bible for yourself and you're just looking and saying, oh yeah, there's a verse, there's a verse, there's a verse, there's a verse. That's how people get deceived. But if you know the Bible because you've read it, you could, think that you, could, you could spot it more easily and say, hey, wait a minute, no. That's someone being cunning. That's someone being crafty. That's someone lying in wait to deceive because I know that that's not what that means. I've read that and that's not the right context. That's not what that's talking about. It's extremely important to read the entire Bible so that you can know and you can judge for yourself what is true and what's not true. Purging sin out of your life. 
Again, another important aspect of our Christian life. It's something that we all, all ought to be focused on, trying to do, trying to become just stronger in the faith and, and just getting sins out of our life. 2 Timothy 2.21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, excuse me, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. See, God's looking down. He's looking for clean vessels to use. He wants to use you. Now, if you just got saved, God could still use you. God could use, just like he used a woman at the well. She had a lot of sin in her life, and he used her. Okay? But what he wants you to do is to keep growing. He wants you to keep pushing forward. Keep improving. Keep getting better. Continue to try to get the sin out of your life because the more you purge the sin out of your life, the more God's going to be able to use you and use you more effectively. John uh, 15 verse 2 says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So you think about this example of fruit. He's saying, first of all, a branch that doesn't bring forth fruit is just going to take you away. And I believe, that, I believe very clearly this is an illustration for soul winning. When you bear fruit, you're bringing forth more fruit. You're bringing forth after your kind. You're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're sowing the seed so that you can bring forth more fruit. You can bring forth salvation. You bring lead people to Christ. If you're not doing any of that stuff, God's like, well, you're, you're useless to me. You're not doing anything for me. You're, I mean, you're my child. You're my son. But, you, I mean, you're lazy. You're not, you're not doing anything. He could just, just take you out of the way, right? You're useless for him. But, he says, every branch that beareth fruit, he's going to purge it that it may bring forth more fruit. So when you look at the, um, I don't, and I don't know that much about, about trees, like, what is it, horticulture or whatever word, you know, I know, I know enough that, like, we, we pick my, grandma, or my wife's grandmother's orange trees every year. And um, they're really fruitful. You get a lot of fruit out of those trees. But in order to, to, to keep the tree producing the maximum amount of fruit, you have to prune off. You have to, you have to get rid of all those dead branches that are in the way that are just taking up that space because if you, if you just leave all those dead branches on there, it's going to kind of smother and take away from, from the, the sunlight and all the nutrition and everything else that, that the good branches need to have in order to continue growing. So what you need to do is you got to get rid of that stuff, get rid of the dead branches, get rid of the stuff that's not producing because it's going to make more room for more more fruitful branches and it's going to help the fruitful branches become even more fruitful. And I don't know all the science behind it, but I know that that's the case and that's the illustration that's being used here. And I believe this is talking about our sin because the more sin you get out of your life, the more fruitful that you will become. The more you'll be able to be used by God, the more you'll be a vessel meet for the master's use. So again, and that's, and that's real generic purging sin out, but um, you know, when you come to church, you can hear more about, about different sins. And, and the goal is not to make you feel bad necessarily as much as it is just to invoke a change and just say, look, this is what God says. If you're doing it, stop doing it. I mean, it's, the choice is yours, but this is, this is what the Bible says, and you ought not to do it. So these are, those are all the different things. Um, we're not quite done yet, but you know, baptism, soul winning, coming to church, praying, reading the Bible, and purging sin out of your life are all things that are extremely important for a Christian to do in order to continue to grow. Now, for those of you that say, well, you've done all those things, or you're doing those things, right? Amen, that's great, but you can't just stop there and just be like, well, I'm done. 1 Corinthians 3, 1, you don't have to turn there, it says, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. And... Basically, you know, you need milk when you're a baby. You need that substance. You need the milk of the word. But as you grow, as you start doing these things, as you're getting older spiritually, you need to get some meat in order, in order to maintain, in order to continue to grow. And can you get strengthened and stronger? You need more than just milk. Now, one way to do that is basically do everything more. <laughs> Everything that we just listed, you have to do it even more. So if you were going out and say like, you know, you're telling some of your relatives about Jesus Christ, great. Don't just stop it. Don't just say like, okay, well, I told my family about Jesus. 
Start going out soaring. We have the times listed in the bulletin. Make it a point to say, you know what? I'm going to continue to grow in my spiritual life. I'm going to make it a point to go out and actually just knock on strangers' doors and just try to give them the gospel too. I'm not going to just limit it to my family. If you've been going out and doing that, try to increase that. Say, you know what? I've been going out an hour a week. I'm going to try to up that. I'm going to, go out. I'm going to see if I can go out two hours a week. Right? And that will continue, that will help you continue to grow as a Christian. I'm, I'm serious. You know, and, and if you do that, say, you know what, I've gone out, I go out, I, I knock doors, I knock strangers' doors. <coughs> Next step for you is just try to become a soul winner in general in your entire life. Everywhere that you go, everything you do, everyone you come in contact with, just just use every single opportunity you can to talk about Christ and about salvation because it's so important. I mean, these are, these are different levels that you can just try to work at and try to achieve. And we constantly need to grow. You see, um, I'll get there in just a second. How about church service, right? Maybe you come to church on Sunday morning or maybe you come to church every once in a while. Start coming to church more often. Start coming to all the church services. Say, well, I already do come to all the church services. Well, start getting involved more with some of the activities. Start getting involved more with what the church is doing. Try to see if you could take on a new ministry for yourself in the church. You know, there's, there's great things. Where does the church have a need? What things need to be done? What skills are you able to offer to help the church to grow, to help the church in general, to help other people within the church? How about going and visiting people in a nursing home? Right? If you haven't done that before, go visit the fathers. Go visit the widows. Go visit the sick. Go visit people in jail. Go bring them the gospel. Go, go try to be a blessing on other people like that. Hey, that's going to help you to grow. That gets you in the right mindset as a minister of Christ. Someone who ministers is not someone who's getting everything done for you. You're going out and doing things for other people. These are areas. Now, do I expect someone who just gets saved to start going out and just you know, doing all this work? No. But you need to grow to get to that point. Now, hey, if they do it, amen, great. And you know what? I'll tell you what. The, the, what, there's a little difference between spiritual growth and physical growth. Physical growth, you really don't have any control over how fast you're going to grow. You have no control of that. The spiritual growth, though, I believe, because I've seen it, some people can grow very fast. And other people take a little bit longer, but it's going to be dependent on how willing you are to grow. How much do you want to, you know, you still have to have some period of time for growth. The, the time is, is, is essential. You can't get around that. But some people, man, I, I remember when I first, not after, I, you know, again, myself as a personal example, when I got saved when I was 20, there was almost no growth right around until about the time I got baptized. Because I wasn't going to church. I wasn't reading the Bible. I mean, every once in a while, I'd dust it off and, you know, open it up and read a chapter or two or, you know, have these good intentions of wanting to read the Bible. And then something would come up the next day. And guess what? Bible reading stopped. But when I got into a good church, actually, when I got plugged into a good church, is when I started to grow. And when I started hearing good preaching, preaching from the Bible, that's why I decided, you know what? I'm going to get right with God. I got baptized. I got a bunch of sin out of my life. I got, you know, soul and all these different things. But see, I, I was hungry then. I was hungry to hear the word. I was downloading sermons from all these different you know, preachers and just reading the Bible as much as possible. I started going out, so you know, doing all these different things. Hey, the growth happens then real fast if you're if you're dedicated and you're, and you're really serious about doing all these things. Now, if you don't want to do all those things, well, you can still grow, but it's going to be a lot slower. Pray more. Make sure you're doing your best to pray without ceasing. Spend quality time with God. We're almost done here. I've got I to wrap it up. We're going to read the Bible more than just once a year. Try to increase the time you spend reading the Bible. Memorize the Bible. Meditate on it. Keep it in your hearts. Study the Bible. Um, yeah, so with reading the Bible, we ought to read the Bible. I think every Christian should read the Bible as a minimum once a year. Now, does the Bible say you have to do that? No. But I just think that's kind of a decent standard that we all ought to keep ourselves to. It's not very much time throughout the day. It's something that we can all kind of do pretty easily. It's not that hard to read the Bible through cover to cover once a year. Okay? But if you're at that point, don't stop there. Don't let that standard become just the standard for the rest of your life. Try to improve on that. 
Start memorizing the Bible, right? If you've never memorized portions of the Bible, start memorizing Scripture. Meditate on it. The Bible does say to do that, to keep it in your heart and to meditate on God's Word. Memorize the Bible. Study the Bible. Now, studying the Bible, I believe, should come after those things. <laughs> because you get in a lot of trouble if you're studying the Bible, but you haven't really read the Bible through cover to cover. Don't do that. Again, it has to do with context. You want to study the Bible, make sure you've read it cover to cover at least once, but I would say even more than that. I mean, when you actually decide to start studying things out and start really digging in and saying, wow, what does the Bible say about this? And really start analyzing it. You're going to need to know the Bible a little bit just to be able to do that. Because, I mean, for one, you're going to need to know where to even look for. Right? And the only way you're going to even kind of know, hey, where have I seen this before? Oh, well, because I've seen it before. Right, I've seen it because I've read it before in this book, in Joshua or in Judges or wherever. Like, like I've seen this. So that's the only way you can really study. You ought to study the Bible. Now, I know a lot of people like to jump on the Internet and just try to find an answer real quick. Don't do that. Let God teach you. Study it out after your reading. I mean, let the growth take place. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we do need to study. But again, the studying should come after you've already read the Bible a few times and after you've already maybe started to memorize it a little bit, then you can start really studying and really showing yourself approved unto God. And that's who you ought to be worried about you're showing yourself approved unto. Don't worry about showing yourself approved unto men. Show yourself approved unto God by studying it and knowing for yourself. See, anybody can just go online and just repeat things that they've heard and repeat doctrine, and you might sound approved unto men. Right? You might sound like you really know what you're talking about. And all you're doing is just parroting and repeating what someone else has studied out, what someone else has done. You need to study the shows I've approved unto God. Study these things out for yourself. Learn them. Know them. And God will know if you've done the work yourself or not. And that's what we ought to be concerned about. And then strive to live righteously. You know, continue to analyze your life identifying different sins, and work on getting rid of them. Now, finally, as one mentions, don't get overwhelmed. We have to understand that the Christian life is not a sprint. It's an endurance race. It's something that we're in for the long haul. We need to continue moving forward towards the finish line. Just keep on moving. And whatever pace that is, whatever pace you give up with, just, just keep moving forward. That is critical. You know, there's a lot of things we mentioned here. There's a lot of things you get. It's easy to get overwhelmed. You're like, man, how am I going to do all this stuff? You know, I just got saved yesterday. How am, I, how am I going to do all this stuff? Just take a deep breath. <laughs> and you're going to do it just one day at a time, slowly, slowly, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You need to just start moving forward, but make sure you're moving in the right direction, that you're not moving backwards. No matter what stage you're on your growth, make sure you're, you're moving forward and not moving backward. If you stumble... If you fall, if you do end up moving back for a little bit, hey, pick yourself right back up and keep moving forward. It's an endurance. It's a long race. And the only way that you can possibly fail is if you just quit. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. And hey, stay in church. Church will help you get the strength that you need. The people here will help you to continue to move forward so that if you do stumble, if you do fall, if you do have these hard times, people in church can help you to build you up and to strengthen you to keep on pushing forward and to keep on moving forward. There's so much more that God has for your life than just to be saved. He's got a plan for each and every one of you individually. Every single person in this room, I believe wholeheartedly, God has a plan for your life. And your plan might be different from someone else's plan, and I guarantee it's different from someone else's plan. But He has a plan for your life. Don't you want to find out what that is? I mean, whatever His plan is, I guarantee you it's going to be better than your plan. He's got something laid out for you much better. Let's, um, let's just strive to, to make sure we're doing what's right with God. Continue to do these things at whatever level you're at. Again, I mean, everyone's at a different level. Everybody is. We need to continue just to try to push ourselves a little bit harder. Do a little bit more. If there's something on this list maybe you haven't done before, before you leave today, just decide, right, you know what? I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to read the Bible for cover to cover because I've never done that before. I'm going to go try to just preach Jesus Christ to one person. I'm going to try to get one person to put their faith in Christ this year. If you've never done that before, I encourage you just to do that. Whatever it may be, but just think about it and try to move forward. Try to, try to grow.
continue just, just to be, become a mature adult in your spiritual life with God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to preach this morning. God, I pray that you please help us all to grow. Help this church to grow. Help every individual here to grow spiritually, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just um, remove any stumbling blocks from our, from our path, from our way. God, strengthen us and embolden us to, to do that which is right. Help us not to become lazy, but to just, um, just stay at it and, and to stay focused and keep the most important things in our minds and our hearts that we don't become complacent and that we don't just, just ignore the importance, especially of the gospel, dear Lord. And, and that could be the driving force for us to do all of these things, is to, is to just be able to be used more by you. The more we come to church, the more we read our Bible, the more we pray, the better and more efficient and more effective we'll be at being able to go out and just help spread the great news of the gospel, that salvation is a free gift, and that we just have to receive it, dear Lord. Help us all to have that primary focus in our hearts that can help drive us to do all of these things to become better Christians and, and more strong Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.